All right, welcome to Talk Jitsu with host Uki Mike, Joey Bresky, and me, Jordan Pressinger from Jordan Teaches Jiu Jitsu. Today we have a great episode for you guys, and what we're going to talk about is CJI and ADCC. Uh, it's been a while since we did a podcast, like six weeks, um, and a lot has happened, and in particular, ADCC and CJI. So um, for those that haven't seen it, we'll try to talk about it uh, and give you like, a, what is it called, like uh, context and whatnot, so you know what we're talking about. So basically... There's two tournaments going on at the same time. CJI, they offered a million dollars for the division winners. There's two divisions and there's also ADCC. And uh, it was a great weekend of grappling and UFC was on that night too. So it was actually like, it's a great weekend of martial arts. Like that was awesome. I wish we had that every single week. But uh, yeah, takeaways from CJI. We'll start with CJI. Um, the pit, let's talk about the pit. The pit is the best way to grapple, um, I think at least. I think every grappling tournament should have a pit if they can afford it or if they can manage it because there's so much less out of bounds. There's so much like watching ADCC after watching CJI and watching the amount of resets was just like, oh my God, this is clearly a problem that CJI fixed, which originally was fixed from karate combat. But uh, yeah, Joey, what did you think about the pit? I liked it. I mean, I thought it was a, a really interesting way to keep people in bounds. Um, and it definitely like, I think it helped with some of the action because you don't have like the stops and starts of refs, like resetting things or like, you know, um, obviously ADCC just lets people like go off into the stands and that is like a safety risk. Um, and like I beat Jeff when you go off to the edge, you know, if there's action, when you hit the edge, I can't restart you in a dynamic position. So like, do we restart statically now and what was dynamic or do we just, say screw it we can't restart in the same spot and back to the feet standing so i thought the pit was a really interesting way to keep people in bounds um my only complaints about it were i think i forget which match it was but someone apparently grabbed the top of it Luke and they were like Arnold. yeah they're like you can't do that at no point was it ever explained to me as a viewer that you couldn't grab the top of touch the top of this pit so like when they said that i was like wait well, you can't what so it would have been nice if maybe they were a little more clear with those rules um yeah, other than that, like I thought it was pretty cool. Yeah, exactly. I think uh like what you said about static, I think we want to avoid all things static. Yeah, Mike, uh what do you think? Do you like the pit? I love the pit. I love or the alley as they called it. I love that uh it kept the action going, there was no stops, and people could utilize it as well. If you had somebody pinned in the corner, you know, with their neck cranked, it was hard for them to get up. They couldn't like wall walk if it was a cage or something like that, or get a restart if it was ADCC, or fall off it if it was UFC fight pass. I really liked how they had that set up. And I love the round system too. I know it caught a lot of shit because the it's flawed in MMA, but I think it worked very well in uh, CJI. I kind of want to pit at the gym, but I don't know if it uh, makes sense because you lose a little bit of mat area, be, a, a little bit, but like having sloped walls, well, not sloped. Oh yeah. Well, and what do you think too? Do you think that like the pit where it has like the straight walls or do you think a slope like uh, like skateboarding, like a ramp, do you think that'd be better? I like I like how they did it in the alley. I, I was going to ask you if you would, if you were thinking about doing a partial part of the wall as, you know, kind of like an alley. I kind of want to. I, and I kind of also want to do a floating floor, not a floating floor, like a spring floor so that you oh, can, yeah, yeah like takedowns feel way better. So I've been seeing a lot of people with like, well, I've just been seeing in my, new, in my Facebook, some people with spring floors and it's making me jealous because, yeah, I would love to have a spring floor and not, you know, take people down and get taken down much safer. But um yeah, I think the pit was a was a really good idea. And uh, I guess another takeaway from CJI was, this is a great question, um, or not question, but I guess it's a great, interesting thing that happened was like Le Levi Jones, he had a really good guard, very hard to pass. And I heard some, um, you know, people speculating like, is like uh, in wrestling, the bottom position is considered defensive and top is offensive. But in Jiu-Jitsu, it's kind of more neutral. But if we clearly define it as the bottom being defensive, then in that scenario, it wouldn't make sense for Levi to win. But there was, uh, you know, controversy. Who won? What's better, being the bottom player or being the top player if nothing is really happening? Um, so that was a bit of an interesting thing because Levi had such a great guard that wasn't passed by anybody. Um, and yeah, presented a good question like, who should win in that uh, in that event where neither one really get anything going? Like it was kind of a boring match in a sense, just because not a lot happened. But it was also kind of exciting. Like I found it kind of exciting uh, too. I mean, it just depends on what you kind of appreciate and what you like to see. But um, 
I yeah. Think, I think for people who don't watch jujitsu regularly or just the average casual, they'd look at that and say it's a boring match, but because we know about jujitsu, we know that, you know, he was taking grips and trying to initiate. So that's why he did win the, was it one round he won? Uh, two rounds. Two rounds. Yeah. And then he didn't adjust. Like he yeah. was having the most offensive success in the beginning. And then he was having less in the last three rounds. So I could, like, I personally think that Cade won, but I can see the, um, the argument for why Levi won. But I think Levi should have been more aggressive in those last three rounds. Like, especially when you see that the rounds aren't going your way, like third round, you lost it. Fourth round, lost it. Like fifth round, you, you should put it all on the line. I think, like, I think both of them should have really, because neither one were really out of breath. I mean, it's for a million dollars. Like I'd be like dead after because I'm doing absolutely everything I can to win that million dollars. Cade was smart though. After he won his match to face Levi, he got in the crowd in the judge's head. He was saying, you know, I don't want to have a boring match with some guy butt scooting all around. He should be up and make it exciting. So he got in the crowd to make them boo. They did boo when, whenever he wouldn't get up and initiate. So he was strategically, that was a good move by Cade to get in the judges and the crowd's ear. That was smart. Like yeah. manipulating the crowd. It's like, you know, when you're at a tournament, and you're like, hey, that was a sweep, ref, that was a sweep, even though it clearly wasn't or yeah. something. You know what I mean? You're just yeah. trying to get points. But yeah, manip manipulating the crowd was smart in that way. But some people, they were not happy with Cade because they felt that he was a little, I guess, immature. That's what they, uh, I don't really think so personally. Like, they, But they felt he didn't deal with it very well. Like just complaining about Levi and what he's doing and he's gaming the system and whatnot. Like, I do agree, like, you know, just you know, if you can't pass his guard, that's on you. But at the same time, Levi couldn't get any offense going either. So yeah, Joey, what do you think? I, I don't know. I, before I, I have a feeling that you're going to say Levi won, but I want to see what you say. I actually have like a lot to say about this. So um, if you watch back through the tournament, traditionally, most of the matches there were scored for the bottom player playing guard, attempting, even if they didn't attempt like deep submissions, but attempting things. Uh, I think Pat Downey, um, Adam Bradley's the best example of this. Downey was taking Bradley down, dominating the position, but Bradley threw up a couple of like really shitty, not real submissions and got the win. Um, it happened in a bunch of matches. The finals here is the only match that they actually favored for the top player here when no passes or no real submission attempts occurred. Um, so clearly, whatever Cade said or whatever he did influenced the judges in a way. I mean, if you look back at the other 15 matches that went to decision, they're all scored in favor of the guard player playing his guard. They're all like unanimously scored that way. So it was really weird to me that this was scored differently. Um, I actually don't blame Levi for not changing his strategy, uh, especially after winning the first whatever he won. I think he won one in three and Cade won two, four, five, or something like that. Um, because throughout the rest of the tournament, his strategy would have won them those matches. So whatever changed in the judges' scoring criteria or whatever Cade said to get in their minds, I actually thought Levi won that quite handily. I think I had a four rounds to one for Levi when I watched it, um, and I had the same on rewatch. Um, he was playing an open guard. He was attempting to entangle legs. Uh, Cade was the one disengaging for the most part. Um, it was very rare that Levi was the one backing up or disengaging. He basically sat here and said, Hey, here is my guard. Pass it. He wasn't closing the guard. He wasn't holding Cade still. Um, like again, I'll use the Adam Bradley match with Pat Downey. Downey was actively trying to be aggressive and Bradley was playing a closed guard, holding him still. Um, if you're playing a closed guard, in my opinion, then like, yeah, sure. That's, that's stalling on the bottom. You're just holding the guy still. You're not doing anything, especially if you're not opening and trying to attack. But Levi kept his guard open pretty much the whole time, um, attempted to enter into things, which again, is easier said than done against a guy like Cade Rutolo, who's not going to stand still long enough for you to enter. But Cade couldn't pass. He couldn't. The guard was open the entire time. He had 25 minutes of open guard and he could not pass a single time. Um, he never had any real submission attempts outside of that triangle, which was excellent. Um, and Levi had multiple entries onto the legs. Um, for the brief moment that Cade played bottom, I actually thought Levi looked fantastic on top. Uh, I know people were saying like, oh, you know, Levi's just a guard player. In my opinion, from watching it, when Cade played that chunk of bottom, I think it was only about 30 to 45 seconds where he played bottom. Levi was pressuring on the pass, and I don't think Cade disengaged because he thought he was showing Levi couldn't pass. I think he got out of there because he didn't feel good on bottom. I think Levi was going to pass that guard in a matter of time. Like I, I really thought Levi had a great game plan. I thought he stuck with it. Um, I know he's training with Lachlan and clearly whatever they did 
um, for their strategy and training and prep for this was really interesting um, and smart. They, they knew the rules and they played to them. I think it's just strange that the judging criteria really seemed to change for that finals. Yeah. I mean, I, I agree with some of what you said, but not all like in the sense of, especially like if it's, if it's, when it's open scoring and you see your strategy isn't working because working in the sense that it's not winning you the rounds, because at that point, I think I think I'm pretty sure he won one and two, if I recall correctly. Um, and then it was three to five that he lost. But I could be wrong. But either way, it was like the later rounds, you could see that he's losing, and he kept with the same strategy. Which I don't know if that's I don't know if that makes sense to me personally. Like I I like I guess the same strategy, but just like push the pace a little bit more. Like I think he what he did have an open guard, but at the same time, he wasn't really letting anyone in his guard in the sense of. Uh, like he wouldn't let anyone attach attached to his shoulders, so he only wanted to get underneath people's hips for, um, you know, leg entries and back takes, which is very like the back takes at least is very like gi style, and then the leg entries is obviously like the meta right now. But um, yeah, like he wouldn't let anyone attached to his shoulders. Like he wouldn't give anything, which you know makes sense for sure. But what I mean is like if when I'm rolling with someone. I might let them get an underhook because I want to use that as an overhook and start to sweep them. But I don't think he had any intention of sweeping. It was just like, don't let them get anywhere near my upper body. So a guy like Joseph Chen, if he were like, that'd be a good style matchup for Joseph. Um, if he could get his upper body grips, but Levi's so good at stopping them. So like he wasn't letting anyone really in too much. It's kind of like, um, like striking, like finding someone that's long and they're keeping you on the outside of their range. And it's like easy to complain. Like I can't get in on them because you know, they're keeping their range. And it's the same kind of thing. I felt like he was keeping his range, not letting them get past his knees whatsoever or attached to his shoulders whatsoever. And yeah, and it's effective, but that limits what he can do. He could only really do leg, leg attacks and um, attack the back, which was a strategy, but it didn't give many options for the top player, which is conservative. And yeah, you can, I don't know. It just depends how you look at it. If that's like, you know, keeping someone in your range, like complaining about like, you know, UFC, UFC fighters that do it, but you got to do what you got to do to win. I don't know I mean, him very well. Does he come from a gi background? Yes. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So it, interesting. You mentioned Joseph Chen, Levi and Joseph actually fought not that long ago, probably like three months ago on a Polaris event and Levi won quite handily. Um, this, but what's really interesting about Levi is he's always been a gi player. Like you said, Mike, he's, uh, an excellent bear bowl artist, but this leg lock game of his is completely new. Um, he's not been a leg lock guy for a long time. Actually, he got knee barred by Tyra Toll the last time they had a match. Um, they, I'd, he's been with Lachlan for a little while now. Clearly, they built an entire leg lock game in not a very long period of time because even at Polaris, he didn't showcase these uh, leg lock entries when he was playing this exact same style of guard. All he really was trying to do was bear and bolo people. Um, and take the back and all of a sudden now he's got really dangerous leg entries i mean obviously he leg locked uh roberto jimenez which is pretty impressive um roberto's really good and was one of my dark horse picks in the tournament so i think it was really impressive that he came up with a strategy but i disagree that he should have let more happen i mean it's his he's controlling the range on the bottom if he's not letting you connect to his upper body like it's not my job to let you have good grips like take them man get them like if you know if Cade's like well i can't get any grips to do anything like that's a you problem man not a me problem <laughs> like if i'm yeah, in a no. tournament and i'm doing my game and a guy's like well i can't do anything offensive to him he's not letting me have anything i'm like then be better i don't know no no like i don't think that um you know he should be pressured into changing his game plan it's more like you know, you can't blame, it's the same thing with someone that's long and striking. You can't blame them for, you know, their style, but it doesn't mean that's exciting either. And um, if you lose, like, a, it says a striking match and you're, you know, at the end of your range and you lose because you couldn't really get them, but they couldn't really get you. Um, it's not that you have to give anything up. It's more so like, it's just, you have to understand that it's not very crowd pleasing more so. Oh, no, I, I agree. My question is really like, what are we trying to reward? Are we trying to reward someone who's exciting um or are we trying to reward good grappling i mean obviously everyone's raving about the the Cade rotolo andrew tackett match which yes there were some moments of really good jujitsu in there and it was really exciting and fun to watch but a lot of that match was just really sloppy shitty wrestling um you know if you i've talked to 
the wrestling coach at my gym and some other wrestlers. And they're all like, it wasn't good wrestling, man. It's just two young, really athletic dudes kind of spazzing out on the feet. And it looks really exciting because there's a lot of motion, but it's not great. Whereas I watch like the Levi and Cade match and like, kind of like you said earlier, it's not as exciting to watch, especially if you're new, but like there's really good grappling happening from both guys there. I mean, um, Levi's guard obviously is incredible, but I thought it was fun to watch Cade struggle a lot in the first couple rounds and then see his strategy slowly adapt the way he entered in on these positions. Um, like, yeah, he didn't get the passes, but the way he went about trying to pass, seeing those little adaptions of just like where he's going to put his foot when he enters into certain positions was really interesting to me. And that was really good grappling. It's not as grab pleasing, but to me, that's way better grappling than the Cade and Andrew match. Yeah. I I mean, I kind of view it as like, you know, when you're wrestling with someone and they just like, they will not let you in and like, which makes sense, but like, they're not really shooting either. So it's just this like stalemate where it's like, shit, do I just like shoot for a takedown that's might not be there or do I, you know what I mean? But because they're not shooting either. So it's just this like stalemate of like, I can't get in, you can't get in. And yeah, it makes sense not to take risks. But um, I think that if you don't take any risks and then if you lose, then you maybe should reevaluate. Maybe I should have taken a little more risks. But I mean, yeah, it's the judges. It's hard to tell exactly what they want. Now we know more go, like going into the next one, the kind of what they want. But um, yeah, I mean, I think that it's easy for him to also have a good leg lock game pretty quickly because all his attacks are in the gi at least were very, not all, but like his like game plan is like get underneath people, like get underneath their hips, connect to their hips. It's just like, it's the same thing. It's just a different way of going about it. Like you're connecting, like you're trying to get your legs into their hips instead of like, you know, take their back or whatever they're going to do. So it's so similar that it makes so much sense that he got good at it quickly. Um, but yeah, I don't know. I, I like the match. I like the match personally. I thought Cade won only by like a small margin, but I could definitely see arguments for either way. Um, yeah. I, and I would have liked to see Andrew Tackett face uh, Levi personally. I think yeah. Andrew um, would have had way more success because I think that he's a guy that will take risks. Like he will go, in and he will not come out until there's something you know like he won't come out like he did so much it's it's almost like you know we don't expect this from a ufc fighters but it's nice when we do watch it where they point to the center of the ring the center of the ring and they're like let's fight which i felt like is basically what did not happen which is okay but you know they didn't like point down like let's let's get this going let's grapple let's try to beat each other it was more like a lot of trying not to lose um i felt like like a lot of it was just very What's the word? Uh, conservative, which nothing wrong with that. It just that's how I felt it was. Yeah, I would like to see. I mean, I think of anything this shows like for the next event they run, which they say they're going to run another one. And I hope they do. Um, maybe we could get a little more clarity on the actual judging criteria. And maybe we could change if we want to encourage more action. Like, let's maybe change some rules around to encourage that. Like, um, you know, you could have a, a rule where we can't pull guard. I mean, if that's what we're all about here. Let's put it in there. Does that change that match? Probably. Probably changes it pretty significantly. Um, we could put a rule where if a guard player is going to play guard, they have X amount of time to <clears throat> meaningfully enact offense or we stand back up. Um, anything but, like that. I mean, but do you I want think, rules? Like, do you want more rules? Or do you think that it, people just shouldn't complain when the rules are kind of um, gametized? Personally, I'm, I'm fine with like, you know, people are going to play the rules, no matter what rule set you use. You can add more rules. People are going to find ways to games those rules. Um, the less constraints we put on how people are allowed to approach it, I think the better. Uh, you just get more. I don't. I think the more you constrain it, the more you're going to take out really valid strategies like Levi's. I mean, if we said you weren't allowed to play guard for more than thirty seconds, then well, Levi's strategy doesn't work, and we're we as viewers and practitioners are deprived of that avenue of offense and victory. So like, yeah, I love watching the crazy wrestling scrambles too, but I also want there to be a place in the sport for the guys who have the unpassable guard. Um, because we got to remember, like if this is a million dollar tournament and they're going to run this regularly, um, the rule set for this is going to shape the way people train just the same way the ADCC rule set and IBJJF rule sets have shaped the way people have been training for years. And if you really start penalizing guard play, that's going to trickle down and you're going to see a diminished value on learning the guard and mastering the guard and getting good at that at all levels of the sport. So 
I don't like rules that diminish that, but if excitement's what they're after, then maybe that's something you look into considering or finding a way to do. Yeah. Yeah. I think the less rules, the better too. And, uh, I don't know the best way to incentivize more action. Um, but I don't think it's so much a problem because again, I, I like the match for sure. And I think most people at do jujitsu probably enjoyed it somewhat, but yeah, I just want to also be clear for the listeners, like what I mean, cause I think it's really interesting of like, um, again, using a striking as an example, just say like you're a long guy and someone's shorter, they come in on you, right? And you could punch them, you know, while they're in range, but you have the risk because now they're in your range and you want to keep them on the outside of your range. But so you could punch them or knee them or whatever, or you could back out and stay in your range, which again, that's why I felt that Levi was doing. He was just having that approach. Um, so yeah, I, I don't know. I want to do a, like a breakdown on Levi's performance. I already like cut up all the clips and I'm really interested. Uh, like it's really interesting to me. And I think people would be really interested in my analysis, but it was cool seeing like how people adapted to his game too, because a lot of people didn't know what to do. Like he would throw in this lasso, um, which isn't very, which isn't super common in Nogi. And some of them would just try to attack it with like a quick, uh, like a quick ankle lock, but they could never get a good like bite on it because it just wasn't there. They're trying to force it so much. So like that was one example of what people were trying to do. But there's other things too, just like trying to like bum rush, the, like just try to explosively like enter the guard. But it's the same kind of thing. Like once they kind of got in, they retreated when they felt any sort of um, danger where, where they could have just bit down on their mouthpiece and um, metaphorically punched them, which in grappling would be like, just, you know, keep progressing. Um, which again, I think Andrew or sorry. Yeah. Andrew Tackett would have done more. But he was like the, I think he was the breakout star of the whole thing, kind of. Um, like Levi was for sure. Cause he, I think I actually think, yeah, Levi looked better than Cade overall. Overall, I don't want to sound like I'm talking shit about Cade, but I would say he did look good overall. Um, but William, better than Cade, I think. But William, I think he just looked the best. He looked like the guy that wanted it the most. And I think that's, um, really good for a crowd and fan, um, I don't know, support. And that goes, that can go a long way too of like, you can make more money outside of that, of CGI just by people liking you and liking your style. So yeah, I think you had a really crowd pleasing style and it's different from like UFC when you're crowd pleasing, you lose brain cells, which isn't very good, but in the grappling you're crowd pleasing. Yeah. You might lose on that million dollars, but you're going to get invited back. You're going to, people are going to want to, you know, buy your instructionals. So I think that William style is just like uh very exciting. I, I really like William. I like the Tackett brothers. And I'm yeah, sad I mean, to see the the older one lose yeah. the guy so much bigger because he should have been in the lower weight class probably. Yeah, I mean those the Tackett brothers definitely uh, like they didn't win the million, but they definitely won the hearts of the fans. And like if you're running a professional grappling event and you're not, if Nogi and you're not inviting the Tacketts, you're basically just giving up viewers and excitement. Like these guys. They didn't win the million dollars. They won a lot of opportunity and hopefully sponsorship off this. And I hope they can leverage that in the future. My only concern for guys like that is like Andrew's 21 and that style is fantastic. I don't know how well that scales as he starts to age. I mean, when you're 30, can you still grapple like that at that pace for that long? Like injuries are going to pile up. Your body's going to break down. That's a lot of movement and a lot of impact. And I wonder if, you know, he's going to be one. I hope not. Like, let me preface by saying, I really hope not. I hope he has a long, really productive career and wins a bunch of things. I like the guy. He seems like a good kid, but I wonder if he's going to be one of those guys who's in a bunch of these events training super hard for a few years. And then you start seeing the injuries pile up. He gets slower and slower until he's kind of just a shell of what he was. I mean, much like the guy he fought in the first round, Nicky Ryan, who, you know, I remember watching Nicky Ryan when he was what the youngest guy to attend an ADCC and he used to be dynamic and have all this and just the entries have piled up. They've killed his game. He's still technical. Nicky Ryan's still an insanely technical and intelligent grappler. His body's just failed him. Yeah. No, as you were talking, I was thinking Nicky Ryan right away. And I think it was Dr. Kickass. He made a good, uh, I don't know, <clears throat> comparison or a good, uh, I don't know, like uh, whatever, but he said that Nikki is more like a recreational grappler. And then Nikki Rodriguez, who got second place at ADCC, he's more like a, a real competitor, like a professional athlete, because Nikki beats, I mean, they're both named Nikki. Uh, Nikki Ryan beats Nikki, no, not Nikki Rod, sorry. 
J Rod. J Rod. I, I I meant J Rod the whole time. So he, I, yeah, I guess he beats J Rod in the gym, but then you know he outperformed him at the competition. Like getting second place is really good because you, if you want to compete as a professional athlete, you need to be a professional athlete. Like you can't be lazy. Like I'm pretty lazy these days. Like I probably would have the exact same cardio as Nikki, but um, if I was preparing for CJI. I would have like done everything I can to win that million. And I'm not sure that he did. Like, uh, I don't really follow the B team channel. I'm just saying, like talking about what I've heard, which is basically that he's a little bit lazy, um, and doesn't do strength and conditioning or his nutrition as, as, uh, you know, good as he should. And he paid the price. He had like barely, barely any cardio. And that's not a great way to represent yourself in front of all these people that are watching you and think highly of you. And you, you know, you can only perform for like a minute or two, which again, I would be in the same boat. So I'm not like, you know, criticizing him. It's just like a million dollars on the line. You got to do everything you can to win that million. I think uh, a lot of it too is like, you know, I've, I, again, I've heard the same things that he's not the most uh, like motivated to train and do all the extra stuff. But I've also heard that there's a lot of injuries that kind of keep him from doing that stuff. I mean, when you've got bad ankles or bad knees, it's really hard to go run 5k or get like extra cardio in because it's just painful. And then, do you have to choose between training or this extra conditioning work because your body can't handle the load of both? And that's kind of my worry for Andrew is just like that, you know, when you're 21, I mean, I remember being 21 and training, you could train three times a day. You could do cardio. Your body will heal. It'll recover. But like I'm 31 now, my body does not do that, man. <laughs> I do not recover or heal that way. Um, so like, I just, I see that style and I wonder how long someone can have that style at that level before you start seeing problems arise. Yeah. Like, I don't even know if I'm going to uh, like shoot double legs anymore or shoot any uh, lower body takedowns because I can feel like my neck is messed up and I don't know if it's worth it. So I, I'm legit thinking about like never shooting a shot again and just doing upper body takedowns because I don't want my uh, neck to get worse. And yeah, as you get older, you kind of realize, Oh shit, I'm not as resilient as I used to be. And yeah, it's not good, but you know, I think with the Nikki thing, I think, yeah, definitely he's got injuries and stuff like that. Um, but most professional athletes do, uh, like, like Kamaro Usman, you know, his knees were blown out, but he still had really good cardio when he fought. Um, probably was on EPO probably. I'm not, I'm not sure, but I mean, if your body's super jacked up, I think you should take time off and let it heal or you should, um, realistically maybe, pick another profession. I mean, if you can't perform at a high level because your body can't do it, um, it, it can't do it, you, you know, to accept it, it sucks. Well, Nikki Rods, or sorry, um, <clears throat> what's his name? Uh, Nikki Ryan is still young enough that he could go through the surgeries and get his ACL reconstructed and probably bounce back fairly quickly. He's still, what is he, early 20s? Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, <clears throat> he just keeps competing with no ACL and, you know, everything being blown out. He could take a year off and heal and come back and maybe – you know, make a big comeback. Yeah. He had stem cells. Um, I think that's what he had in his knee, but it didn't really do the trick hundred percent. Um, it probably would have made more sense to have surgery and then get stem cells to make it even better. But yeah, it's, it's too bad. I wanted to see Nikki Ryan do well, yeah. but, uh, in terms of ADCC, um, I guess takeaways from that is I feel kind of bad, honestly, for, um, ADCC people just in the sense that like, I agree. I like CJI and more in support of that, but I felt kind of bad that like the thunder was a little bit taken from them or the prestige a little bit, just because, you know, there's some guys on the podium that definitely wouldn't have made the podium otherwise. Um, if like the CJI guys were there and they have to kind of live with that of like people saying like, Oh, well, you didn't really deserve it. Like you wouldn't have got it otherwise, stuff like that. Like that's kind of shitty for them. So I feel bad in that sense, but it was still pretty like overall a good event. Like, I am, I'm, I'm pretty much team CJI, but yeah, me too. Yeah. But I, I still like, you can't deny that I enjoyed ADCC as well. Yeah. I mean, I, I think it was it. a, I think it was a fantastic event. I've caught up on most of it. Um, I do agree with you. Like it, it is a shame for these guys who just won, you know, you've been training your whole life. You, maybe you chose not to do CJI or like, I especially feel bad for the people in like the weight classes where, um, it wouldn't have made sense to do CJI. Obviously, being under eighty, over eighty, there's a lot of guys um, at ADCC in those like in between weight classes where it's like, man, I'm not really going to be competitive at over eighty because I'm too small, but I can't make under. Or they're 
the 66 guys who are just too small to make 80 and be competitive in that anyways. Um, you know, they train super hard for this. They have amazing performance. Maybe they medal or win. And it seems like the grappling community just kind of doesn't care or devalues that because they weren't at CJI or there's this other tournament. Like I obviously really support CJI and giving the athletes money. Um, I think paying them really well is super important, but it does feel bad for some of those guys who like, maybe it gets a little overlooked that what they accomplished this weekend. Yeah, yeah definitely. Uh, there'll be an asterisk beside their name or some people feel like there'll be an asterisk beside their name. Like, know? I mean, there is for some of them in terms of like, I'm not talking shit about Wagner Hocha, but you know, he got a silver medal and he's like 42 years old. I think this is a, the best he's done at ADCC. And it was a lot easier to do because there wasn't as much, you know, solid competition um, at this ADCC. I like Wagner Hocha. I learned so much from his Kimura uh, trap instructional back in the day and I like him, but realistically, um, would he got second place otherwise? No, but I mean, if, that's still an accomplishment. That's still pretty cool. That I mean, he's 42 years old, got it. But uh, yeah, that, that asterisk is still there, which just kind of sucks um, for him. Another takeaway, let's go back to CJI really quick. Um, first of all, I'm doing a lot better saying CJI instead of CGI because <laughs> I've been saying CGI for like so much. Um, but Mackenzie Dern versus uh, Theon Davies. Mackenzie kind of j- just like tried to bum rush her. Um, it was a kind of a strange strategy. I thought like she just came forward and then kind of got her butt kicked. Yeah, not, I mean, I could, I don't really think anyone was actually picking Mackenzie Dern to win this match. Um, you know, Mackenzie was a great grappler. Like I, she was one of the best women in the world when we were coming up, obviously she's got all those titles and stuff, but like she is doing MMA. She's focused on that. And whether she employs a grappling heavy style at MMA or not, it's still not jujitsu. You're not training for the jujitsu rule sets. Um, you're splitting time and there's only so much time in a day. If you're doing any MMA training at all, that's time you're not spending doing jujitsu. Whereas Fion is just doing grappling and the, the game changes over time. Best practices change. And Fion's one of the best female grapplers in the world right now. Um, and I think this was just kind of like a, you know, the new generation beat the old generation kind of thing. And I give a lot of credit to Mackenzie for just taking this match and doing it. She didn't have to do that. Um, I can't imagine she needs the money she would have gotten from this. Uh, Having, you know, already won a bunch of these things, being pretty popular, having UFC career. Um, And I have to imagine she kind of had an idea of how this would go. I mean, she probably thought she would win. I think most athletes do, but you have to know you're fighting one of the best in the world at grappling right now. And this is a possible outcome, but I think she helped bring a lot of eyes to this. Maybe people coming from MMA who are fans of her, um, who now get to see Fion and maybe they're fans of Fion now and they can watch that going forward or just watch more women's jujitsu. And I think, you know, she didn't have to take this match. I'm glad she did. The performance was a little strange, but I'm just glad she was there and it was a good match. Yeah. What did you think about uh, <clears throat> Gabby Garcia versus Craig Jones, Mike? I think part of it was a work because obviously we, we know that he could have finished her in the heel hook that he had and, he, and the other, uh, the twister that he had. But uh, overall, I think it was a fun match and uh, I don't think anybody was going into it too seriously. I thought it was very fun. What do you think, Joey? Not my cup of tea. Um, just not something I'm interested in I'm, I'm not a wwe fan i'm not a fan of like the spectacle stuff like that i, I really just want to watch actual high level competitive grappling and that match isn't that but i do think um and i do want to say like uh you know jordan we came up when gabby was winning all these world titles and was the best in the world in this unbeatable woman but a lot of it because of her size and style like, I don't think she ever really got the credit she deserved. I don't think she got, you know, the respect she deserved, really. Um, so I appreciated that Craig kind of gave her some spotlight, put some eyeballs on her. Hopefully she got paid. Um, you know, it, it, the lead up was fun. It was a fun little gimmick. Uh, the fight, not so much for me, but I kind of just respect Craig for giving Gabby the spotlight for a little while, the spotlight that I don't really think she got during her career. Like she should have. So good on Craig for doing that. She was supposed to be inducted into the ADCC hall of fame that weekend. And right. And is that right? 
And then yeah, she I fucked it so. off and did CJI. Yeah. Yeah, they might have inducted her into the Hall of Fame and given her a nickel or something. Yeah. Whatever they pay for that. Um but you know, I just I think this is just it was good for Gabby. Um I think there's a lot of fans right now who don't know what she accomplished during her career and maybe only are gonna know her for this. And that's unfortunate. Um because she did have a really amazing career and is one of the best female grapplers of all time. So I'm glad she got a little bit of a spotlight. And what'd you guys think of the commentators at CJI? Like, I think that Brandon McGraffin did a great job. Uh, I think he was, yeah, he did amazing really. But I think the other two guys, um, I don't want to sound like I'm talking shit, but I don't think they, they did a great job. Um, especially what really bothered me was they kept saying that the wrestlers have no grappling experience when that's not, Wrestling is grappling. And they kept saying that. I was like, what are you talking about? They were like, oh, yeah, they never grappled before. They're just new to grappling. Like, no, they've been grappling their whole lives. Like, there might be new to jiu-jitsu, submission grappling. But I'm sure it was kind of like, you know, like me saying CGI constantly, kind of like a slip, like not really saying the right word. But I was like, what are you guys talking about? Um, but I don't know if you guys noticed that. They kept saying that. I mm-hmm. didn't I didn't pick up on that, no. I thought there were actually like, a, my, I had a couple of problems with the commentary. One of the big ones was like, um, just saying who they thought won around. And then when the judges came in with a score, like just openly disagreeing, but there were a couple times where they disagreed and then just really didn't have any reason why. Um, it seemed like they were as confused on the rules as I was as a viewer on the scoring. So there were a couple times there where it's like, if you're the production for the event, like a little less opinion would have been good maybe. And a little more like, you know, they did this, they did that. Like, tell me what's actually happening here and less opinion on the matches. Um, but I, I do agree. Like, it was really interesting how some of the wrestlers maybe didn't get the respect for their experience. Like, uh, one of my standout stars of the event was Jason Nolf. Um, I was really big on Nolf coming into this. Uh, I'm a big fan of the guy. I think he's an incredible grappler. Um, and his performance against Ty was like, yes, he got submitted. The guy is pretty new to submission grappling. Um, if he sticks around, which I know he said on Instagram, he plans on competing in jujitsu more. I think he's going to be a really big problem for a lot of guys, uh, especially as he rounds out that submission skill set. Um, like to disagree with the commentators, Nolf has a lifetime of grappling experience. Um, in a, I, I hate to say this because I come from a jujitsu background, but in a much more professional setting than most jujitsu people do. Um, like, it's not just training for fun at a gym, putting on a gi, rolling around. Like he comes from a collegiate wrestling background. I mean, he's been training since childhood to win world championships. Um, like there's actual structure and infrastructure built around his training. Like all of these guys who come from wrestling, it's it's not like jujitsu where you can just show up once a week, twice a week if you feel like it. You can have a good time. You can do that. Like you have to. If you're going to college on scholarship for wrestling, there are practices. There is a regiment you must maintain. Like, uh, it's a different type of training, and I think it's really good for jujitsu to have those guys. Him, um, Kirk Fleet from the heavyweight division, who I, as far as I know, has done literally zero submission grappling in his life. So that was interesting to see. Um, if these guys start transitioning over, I think they'll be a big problem for more traditional submission grapplers in the future. Yeah, I think so too. I think it was good to have them. Um, but at the same time, I also felt like it was kind of a a waste of a spot because realistically, um, a wrestler wasn't going to win. Like, I mean, what are you going to do? Like, take the guy down and then let him up, take him down again, let him up. Like, I think that they face too much danger in someone's guard. Like, they might take him down, but then it's like, shit, if I stay here, I'm going to get submitted. So, like, I didn't think they had a real uh, path to victory. And I felt like it was kind of just. I don't know. I wouldn't say pointless, but uh, because there was advantages of having them there, like more eyes on the sport, like more wrestlers uh, seeing it and everything is good. But yeah. They were, I don't know, they haven't really had a chance of winning. So I didn't love how many there were, I guess I would like to see more jujitsu guys, but at the same time, it's not like you could have had more jujitsu guys that would have won either because the best guys were there. So it didn't really take any spots that, you know, would have won either. That's interesting. I, I actually really disagree. I mean, um, especially in the heavyweight division in the lightweight division, things are a little different, but in the over 80, there were basically no submissions from bottom, uh, through the entire event. So obviously like top position, super prioritized. Um, I thought Pat Downey got robbed in that quarterfinal against Adam Bradley. Yeah. I thought Downey won that clearly. And I think Downey versus Nikki rod would have been an extremely interesting, uh, semifinal. They've wrestled recently, semi recently, 
Um, Downey beat Nikki Rod quite handily. Obviously, it's a different sport, but it would have been interesting to me to see some of those guys against like Nikki Rod is he's a very good grappler. Congratulations to him on winning the million dollars. He looked unstoppable this weekend, but he does come from a very wrestling heavy background. Um, you can see it in his style. He doesn't go for triangles and arm bars from the bottom. He's very much a get on top, scramble, take the back kind of guy. Um, and I think that serves him really well against a lot of jujitsu practitioners. I'd like to see him against, you know, I know he lost in the first round to Felipe Andrew. I think that's the worst draw possible, but I would have liked to have seen Nicky Rod and Greg Kirkfleet. Um, Kirkfleet is a significantly more accomplished wrestler than Nicky Rod. Um, he's large, he's athletic, and I'm not really sure how Nicky would have gotten on top. And I would have liked to have seen what would happen when Nicky Rod's forced to play from the bottom. I, th- I think he would have destroyed from the bottom because I think these guys uh, have no experience, like, well, not no experience, but very little experience, you know, grappling jujitsu um, against someone that's grappling jujitsu as well. So, you know, Nikki might not be super effective with triangles and whatnot from the bottom against guys that do jujitsu, but I think you'd have a much easier time against guys that don't do jujitsu, uh, like wrestlers, like, especially in a five uh, round match. Like, if it was the finals and it was Nikki against that wrestler. I don't think that he could go 25 minutes without losing like the wrestler. I think that he would get submitted by Nikki. Um, yeah. Within that 25 minutes, I just don't see any path to victory uh, whatsoever for the wrestlers personally, but yeah, I see your so point. I think that's sure. interesting because uh, Kirk fleet fought Felipe Andrew in the first round. And in my opinion, at the heavyweight level, Andrew has the best guard of any black belt um, for a heavyweight. He's fantastic. And he couldn't submit him from the bottom. So it would have been really interesting to me. Like I, I'm not saying I think Kirkfleet would have won, um, but I want to see that. I want to know what it looks like. I'm curious. Um, so, you know, that that's my only bummer about that is I just wish I'd gotten to see that match in particular. Um, but I think it was good to have them there, and I think it definitely showcased some guys who might transition over at some point in the future, and this is a great way for them to start. And I think it's a good way for us to market jujitsu to wrestlers. I mean, I know there were a lot of people from the wrestling community who this is the first submission grappling event they've ever watched because these wrestlers were present. And uh, from what I've seen and from what I've heard, the reception was actually pretty positive. And I think anytime we can expand our sport to a new audience or get new people, maybe interested in our sport, that's a good thing. Yeah, I agree. I think that was the biggest benefit of it was just, yeah, promoting the sport for wrestlers. I think if you're a high level wrestler, um, why would you not uh, switch to jujitsu? That's how I feel. Like because there's just more money in it. There's more opportunity in it. Uh, unless you're like so high level that you're going to the Olympics um, for wrestling. Like I, I think if you're on that cusp of like you're just you're not quite good enough to be on the Olympic team, but you're elite uh, nonetheless. Man, I would switch to jujitsu like instantly because it doesn't take much for a really good wrestler to get good at jiu-jitsu, but I think they also need to approach it as like, I'm going to learn jiu-jitsu. Like I'm going to learn the guard. I'm going to learn everything I can about jiu-jitsu, not just like how can I adapt my wrestling to um, jiu-jitsu? That's how I feel. But I mean, the pros and cons, I uh, think like, of doing either way, but it's like in MMA, like um, if someone's really good at jiu-jitsu, I mean, they better get good at wrestling so they can take that person down or they better have some sort of, um, a little bit of striking at least so they can at least know when strikes are coming. Um, so yeah, if I was a wrestler, I would try to learn jujitsu and not just wrestling for jujitsu. Um, and then you'd be a killer. It's off topic, but how did you guys feel about Gordon Ryan's performance on the weekend? I didn't watch it to be honest. I, I, I didn't get a chance to. Oh, Oh boy. Um, uh, not the best Gordon has looked. Um, I actually thought this was the worst Gordon's looked in a long time. I thought Felipe looked way better in that match. Um, The Yuri Samoa's match. Yeah. Gordon scored a lot of points, but they all came from a really similar sequence, just kind of repeated over time. So like, it's not like um, he was doing a lot of crazy stuff. It was kind of just like, here's a pass to Mount Yuri regards, same pass to Mount scoring on that sequence over and over. But yeah, Gordon did not look as dominant as he has in the past. Um, I don't know if that's health issues. I don't know what it is, but I didn't leave super impressed. I mean, from the weekend, if you ask me which over 80 kilogram grappler is the best in the world, I have to say Nikki Rod. Um, 
I know he made his weird bat challenge thing to Gordon and just based on the form they both looked in this weekend, if I was Gordon, I would probably say no to that. Um, yeah, not, not the best Gordon performance we've seen. No. Yeah. I think, I think like from what I've heard, uh, cause again, I didn't end up watching it, but he's less physical than he used to be and just has uh shit cardio right now. So yeah, he's, I mean, probably health issues definitely contribute to that. Like being on so much steroids for so long can't be good for your health. And uh, he's probably paying the price now. Probably. Uh, but I think, you know, what I think was interesting too was like the eye test of like who was on steroids and who wasn't for CJI and ADCC. Like, I don't, I don't want to make any accusations, but Levi Jones, he looked like he was enhanced. I think so, which kind of made me happier for Cade that he won too, because Cade, I'm pretty sure, isn't on steroids. And losing a match and losing a, a, where, you, where you win a million dollars to someone that's on steroids when you've been vocal against it and natural your whole life, that would be really shitty. Um, again, I don't know for sure if Levi's on steroids, but he looks pretty jacked. So I'm, I'm glad the natural athlete won. It's weird that he's so vocal against it because his coach is definitely on something. <clears throat> yeah. 100%. Well, but yeah, I, I agree. Uh, but what do you guys think? Cause I don't want to, again, I don't know if Levi's on steroids, but what do you guys think? What, what do you, why do you think that is it? Cause he had a bit of a GH gut. Yeah. A bit of a GH gut. You can see his abs poking through his uh, rash guard. He's got like, he's lean, but he's got really, you know, wide shoulders and arms. It's just like, from what I can tell with the eye test, he doesn't pass, but I could be wrong. I, I don't, I'm neutral to that. I don't know. I'd have to, I'd have to see. What do you think? Chances like 50, 50? Uh, I'd say well, any, most people are on something in the sport. Look at Craig Jones is on gear and he's doesn't look like he's on gear. Right. So sure. He could be on something for sure. Yeah. I mean, I, I, it's submission grappling at the highest level. I'd call it 80, 20, at least when he's on something like, I don't know. And I'm not going to like, I'm not an expert. I can't speculate on that but like it, we know how this sport is at the top level uh would i blame him no but it was nice to see someone who like you know is openly anti-steroid win like i think that's actually like a good uh like just a good reminder for a sport that like hey you guys don't have to be on this stuff like it's not necessary to win but Mike, I do, I do agree with you. It is always funny to me that the Rutolos are so anti-steroid. Yeah. And then you look at their team, like not just Andre, but the rest of their team. And you're like, guys, yeah. uh, a little bit of hypocrisy going on here. A lot of it, yeah. Yeah. And like, I don't actually care if people are enhanced or not. Um, other than when they're facing someone that's clearly not like, I'm pretty confident Kate is natural. So I was happy that the natural athlete won, but again, I don't want to sound like I'm, I'm not sure. I'm not sure. So I'm not talking shit about Levi. Levi's really good, really good guard. And uh, if he's on steroids, that's fine. But it was nice seeing Cade win because of that. I, that's why I think at least. But um, and yeah, any more takeaways uh, from ADCC or CJI? Uh, man, both events were really good. Um, Mika Gavao looked fantastic. Um, his wrestling is. Got I thought really he didn't good. look great. To be honest, really? I thought he, yeah, he didn't look himself. Like he looked a little, um, he looked more mortal than ever, especially losing to uh, Dante Leon. But just the matches before that, I thought he looked a little bit more mortal. But it's also when you're so good that your expectations put upon you are just to crush everyone with ease. And then like you face just a little bit of trouble. And then, you know, they're like, oh, bad performance or whatever. But not that he faced a lot of trouble. It's just like, yeah, I mean, just, I'm just used to seeing him dominate this a little bit more um what else is gonna say uh yeah Giancarlo oh that was another thing watching Giancarlo against uh J-Rod I felt it was kind of similar situation where I'm not sure if uh Giancarlo well I'm pretty you know I'm like 99 sure he's on gear he's like freaking jacked and I'm pretty sure that J-Rod isn't so that kind of made me a little bit sad to see uh J-Rod lose to uh, a guy that's clearly enhanced I thought J-Rod did really well, too. I was really impressed with Jay. Um, one of my big standouts from the ADCC event was Owen Jones, uh, the first European trials winner. Um, I thought Owen looked fantastic in the first couple rounds. Um, he lost to Diego Pato in the semis. Uh, I get that Owen likes the leg locks and is a leg locker, but I don't know if I do that strategy against 
probably the best leg locker in that weight class maybe was not the best strategy but owen looked really good for those first couple rounds um seems like a really uh energetic let's say young kid who likes being on the microphone um i hope he continues to win at the high level because i think he's like a you know a rambunctious guy who's definitely going to cause a lot of beef and drama with other athletes and that's good for the scene and hopefully make some money off that down the road. I just want to see what he can do. Um, he really impressed me. I think surprise of the weekend was Marigali getting beat by, um, what's his name? Pixley. Uh, Michael Pixley. Pixley. Pedigo. Yeah. yeah. And because he, uh, Marigali had a single leg, he was coming up to, he came up to the body lock and was driving forward and he got Uchi modded. And it's funny because Joe Brisa always says like, don't switch from the body to, uh, sorry, the, the, the single to the body. Um, cause you had Uchi modded and sometimes people disagree with him. Uh, and then, and I saw on Reddit, someone's like, Oh, somewhere, uh, Joe Brisa is cre- creaming his pants right now <laughs> because he's like, you know, kind of proof, right. In that sense. But one thing, uh, cause Joe's here right now, actually, um, I found interesting that he said is that he's a conservative grappler and that, and that's why he says that like, don't switch from the single to the body lock. Like, can that be effective? Um, yeah, for sure. But especially when you're not driving forward, but a conservative grappler would be like, no, I'm not going to switch from the single to the, to the body because that Uchi Mata risk. So that just right there, that, that kind of like, I don't know, it was a good perspective of like, you can think something's right. Um, because that's the approach you take. Like your mindset is like conservative or you can be like, oh, that's not so much a rule because I'm less conservative. I'm just going to, you know, be more like take more risks. Right. So it kind of just depends on your mindset. So that, yeah, that kind of like, I don't know. I thought that was pretty interesting, but we have one more thing. Oh yeah. Like I haven't been on the discord in a while for uh ecological. I'm sure when Deandre Corb lost, uh, probably they were not too, I don't know. Ecological probably in shambles. Like everyone, like, uh, what, what happened there? Like I didn't, I didn't watch the match. Uh, he, he lost, <laughs> uh, you know, he, Fought a really good grappler. I thought he put up a really good fight. Um, I thought it was a good match. He, he made a good account of himself. I don't think he got outclassed at all. Um, but he just wasn't the better grappler on that day, which is, you know, it's fine. It happens. Yeah. Yeah. I, I just want, I want to say one thing about that Uchimata, the body lock to Uchimata. Um, we saw about 10,000 uh, sloppy ass Uchimatas in the uh, Andrew Tackett Cade Rutola fight. Uh, I don't think a single one of them worked, but we saw a bunch of them attacked. I think one of the big differences in the Marigali Pixley matches, there is a significant difference in the level of wrestling skill between those two athletes. Uh, Marigali is for jujitsu, a we'll say maybe competent wrestler, uh, satisfactory at best. Pixley is an incredibly uh, skilled wrestler. Uh, and this is a man who's made a, made a collegiate career launching people. Um, I'm not really sure why Miragali decided that he wanted to wrestle that man. Um, and maybe an ego played a part of that. But when you make those little mistakes that you definitely might get away with against an equal level opponent, like uh, switching from the single leg to a body lock, you can definitely get away with that. Like there are times when that works. Um, but if you're going to get punished for things like that, it's going to happen a lot more when there's a massive skill differential. It, you know, it's the same thing in jujitsu. There are certain things that we say like, Hey, you probably shouldn't do because people can punish that against someone, the same skill level, you might get away with it. But if you fight someone who's significantly better, the odds of you paying the price for mistakes are way higher. And Pixley definitely took advantage of that because Miragali decided to just fight the perfect fight for Michael Pixley. I, I do not understand why that was the strategy he took. And I think he dislocated his shoulder or something off that Uchi Mata throw or injured it or something, which unfortunate, but you know, like this is Pixley's game is wrestling into that front headlock series, which he like, Hey, it looked good, man. He did it. Um, but yeah, like, I don't know if it's necessarily the move selection. I think it's a combination of the move selection and the opponent that he had to face. Yeah, he probably won't do it again. I would think that he was self-organized to like realize not a good idea. Maybe, maybe I don't know. We'll see. Anyways, <laughs> um, yeah, it's been a good time. Thanks for everyone listening. We didn't talk about ecological this time too much, so it was a good time. Uh, it's glad it's good to be back. We'll see. We'll see everyone next episode.